Chapter Eleven of Moonfleet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner. Chapter Eleven, The Sea Cave. The dull loneliness, the black shade that these hanging vaults have made, the strange music of the waves beating on these hollow caves. Whither? He set me down in one corner, where was some loose, dry silver sand upon the floor, which others had perhaps used for a resting place before. "'Thou must lie here for a month or two, lad,' he said. "'Tis a mean bed, but I have no many worse, and will get straw to-morrow, if I can, to better it.' I had eaten nothing all day, nor had Elzevir, yet I felt no hunger, only a giddiness and burning thirst like that which came upon me when I was shut in the Mahoon vault. So it was very music to me to hear a pat and splash of water dropping from the roof into a little pool upon the floor, and Elzevir made a cup out of my hat, and gave a full drink of it that was icy cool and more delicious than any smuggled wine of France. And after that I knew little that happened for ten days or more, for fever had hold of me, and as I learnt afterwards I talked wild and could scarce be restrained from jumping up and loosing the bindings that Elzevir had put upon my leg and all that time he nursed me as tenderly as any mother could her child, and never left the cave except when he was forced to seek food. But after the fever passed, he left me very thin, as I could see from hands and arms, and weaker than a baby, and I used to lie the whole day not thinking much, nor troubling about anything, but eating what was given me, and drawing a quiet pleasure from the knowledge that strength was gradually returning. Elzevir had found a battered sea-chest up on Peveril Point, and from the side of it made splints to set my leg, using his own shirt for bandages. The sand-bed, too, was made more soft and easy with some armfuls of straw, and in one corner of the cave was a little pile of driftwood and an iron cooking-pot. And all these things had Elzevir got by foraging of nights, using great care that none should see him, and taking only what would not be much missed or thought about but soon he contrived to give Ratsey word of where we were, and after that the sexton fended for us. Though none even of the landers knew what was become of us, save only Ratsey, and he never came down the quarry, but would leave what he brought in one of the ruined cottages a half-mile from the shaft. And all the while there was strict search being made for us, and mounted excisemen scouring the country. For though at first the posse took back Maskew's dead body, and said we must have fallen over the cliff, for there was nothing to be found of us, yet afterwards a farm-boy brought a tale of how he had come suddenly on men lurking under a wall, and how one had a bloody foot and leg, and how the other sprung upon him, and after a fierce struggle wrenched his master's rook-piece from his hands, rifled his pocket of a powder-horn, and made off with them like a hare towards Corfe. And as to Maskew, some of the soldiers said that Elzevir had shot him, and others that he died by misadventure, being killed by a stray bullet of one of his own men on the hilltop. But for all that, they put a head-price on Elzevir of fifty and twenty for me, so we had reason to lie close. It must have been Maskew that listened that night at the door when Elzevir told me the hour at which the cargo was to be run, for the posse had been ordered to be at Hawhead at four in the morning. So all the gang would have been taken had it not been for the Galda making earlier, and the soldiers being delayed by tippling at the lobster. All this Elzevir learnt from Ratsey, and told me to pass the time, though in truth I had as lief not heard it, for it is no pleasant thing to see one's head wrote down so low as twenty. And what I wanted most to know, namely how Grace fared, and how she took the bad news of her father's death, I could not hear, for Elzevir said nothing, and I was shy to ask him. Now when I came entirely to myself, and was able to take stock of things, I found that the place in which I lay was a cave some eight yards square, and three in height, whose straight-cut walls showed that men had once hewn stone therefrom. On one side was that passage through which we had come in, and on the other opened a sort of door which gave on to a stone ledge eight fathoms above high water mark, for the cave was cut out just inside that iron cliff-face which lies between St. Alban's Head and Swanage. 
but the cliffs here are different from those on the other side of the head, being neither so high as Hawhead nor of chalk, but standing for the most part only a hundred or an hundred and fifty feet above the sea, and showing towards it a stern face of solid rock. But though they rise not so high above the water, they go down a long way below it, so that there is fifty fathom right up to the cliff, and many a good craft out of reckoning in fog, or on a pitch-dark night, has run full against that frowning wall, and perished ship and crew, without a soul to hear their cries. Yet though the rock looks hard as adamant, the eternal washing of the wave has worn it out below, and even with the slightest swell, there is a dull and distant booming of the surge in those cavernous deeps, and when the wind blows fresh, each roller smites the cliff like a thunderclap, till even the living rock trembles again. It was on a ledge of that rock face that our cave opened, and sometimes on a fine day Elzevir would carry me out thither, so that I might sun myself and see all the moving channel, without myself being seen. For this ledge was carved out something like a balcony, so that when the quarry was in working they could lower the stone by pulleys to boats lying underneath, and perhaps haul up a keg or two by the way of ballast, as might be guessed by the stanchions still rusting in the rock. Such was this gallery. And as for the inside of the cave, t'was a great empty room, with a white floor made up of broken stone dust, trodden hard of old, till one would say it was plaster, and dry, without those sweaty damps so often seen in such places. Save only in one corner a land spring dropped from the roof, trickling down over spiky rock icicles, and falling into a little hollow in the floor. This basin had been scooped out of set purpose, with a gutter seaward for the overflow and round it, and on the wet patch of the roof above, grew a garden of ferns and other clinging plants. The weeks moved on, until we were in the middle of May, when even the nights were no longer cold, as the sun gathered power. And with the warmer days my strength too increased, and though I dared not yet stand, my leg had ceased to pain me, except for some sharp twinges now and then, which Elvazir said were caused by the bone setting and then he would put a poultice made of grass upon the place, and once walked almost as far as children to pluck sorrel for a soothing mash. Now though he had gone out and in so many times in safety, yet I was always ill at ease when he was away, lest he might fall into some ambush and never come back. Nor was it any thought of what would come to me if he were caught that grieved me, but only care for him. For I had come to lean in everything upon this grim and grizzled giant, and love him, like a father. So when he was away I took to reading to beguile my thoughts, but found little choice of matter, having only my aunt's red prayer-book that I thrust into my bosom the afternoon that I left Moonfleet, and Blackbeard's locket. For that locket hung always round my neck, and I often had the parchment out and read it, not that I did not know it now by heart, but because reading it seemed to bring grace to my thoughts, for the last time I had read it was when I saw her in the manor woods. Elzevir and I had often talked over what was to be done when my leg should be sound again, and resolved to take passage to Saint Malo in the Bonaventure, and there lie hid till the pursuit against us should have ceased. For though t'was wartime, French and English were as brothers in the contraband, and the shippers would give us bit and sup, and glad to, as long as we had need of them. But of this I need not say more because t'was but a project, which other events came in to overturn. Yet was this very errand, namely, to fix with the Bonaventure's men the time to take us over to the other side, that Elzevir had gone out, on the day of which I shall now speak. He was to go to Poole, and left our cave in the afternoon, thinking it safe to keep along the cliff-edge even in the daylight, and to strike across country when dusk came on. The wind had blown fresh all the morning from south-west, and after Elzevir had left, strengthened to a gale. My leg was now so strong that I could walk across the cave with the help of a stout blackthorn that Elzevir had cut me, and so I went out that afternoon on to the ledge to watch the growing sea. There I sat down with my back against a protecting rock, in such a place that I could see up-channel, and yet shelter from the rushing wind. The sky was overcast, and the long wall of rock showed grey, with orange-brown patches, and a darker line of seaweed at the base, like the understrake of a broat's belly, for the tide was but beginning to make. 
There was a mist, half fog, half spray, scudding before the wind, and through it I could see the white-backed rollers lifting over Peveril Point. While all on the cliff face, the seabirds thronged the ledges, and sat huddled in snowy lines, knowing the mischief that was brewing in the elements. It was a melancholy scene, and bred melancholy in my heart, and about sundown the wind south to point or two, setting the sea more against the cliff, so that the spray began to fly even over my ledge, and drove me back into the cave. The night came on much sooner than usual, and before long I was lying on my straw bed in perfect darkness. The wind had gone still more to south, and was screaming through the opening of the cave. The caverns down below bellowed and rumbled. Every now and then a giant roller struck the rocks such a blow as to make the cave tremble, and then a second later there would fall, splattering on the ledge outside, the heavy spray that had been lifted by the impact. I have said that I was melancholy, but worse followed, for I grew timid and fearful of the wild night and the loneliness and the darkness, and all sorts of evil tales came to my mind, and I thought much of baleful heathen gods that St. Aldham had banished to these underground cellars, and of the man-drive who leapt on people in the dark and strangled them. And then fancy played another trick on me, and I seemed to see a man lying on the cave floor, with a drawn white face upturned, and a red hole in the forehead, and at last could bear the dark no longer, but got up with my lame leg, and groped round till I found a candle, for we had but two or three in store. It was only with much ado I got it lit, and set up in the corner of the cave, and then I sat down close by, trying to screen it with my coat. But do what I would, the wind came gusting round the corner, blowing the flame to one side, and making the candle gutter as another candle guttered on that black day at the Why Not. And so thought whisked round, till I saw Maskew's face wearing a look of evil triumph when the pin fell at the auction, and again his face grew deadly pale, and there was the bullet mark on his brow. Surely there were evil spirits in this place to lead my thoughts so much astray, and then there came to my mind that locket on my neck, which men had once hung round Blackbeard's to scare evil spirits from his tomb. If it could frighten them from him, might it not rout them now, and make them fly from me? And with that thought I took the parchment out, and opening it before the flickering light, although I knew all, word for word, conned it over again, and read it out aloud. It was a relief to hear a human voice, even though twas nothing but my own, and I took to shouting the words, having much ado even so to make them heard for the raging of the storm. The days of our age are threescore years and ten, and though men be so strong that they come to fourscore years, yet it is their strength then but labour and sorrow. So soon passeth it away, and we are gone. And as for me, my feet were almost— at the almost I stopped, being brought up suddenly with a fierce beat of blood through my veins, and a jump fit to burst them, for I had heard a scuffling noise in the passage that led to the cave, as if someone had stumbled against a loose stone in the dark. I did not know then, but have learnt since, that when there is a loud noise such as the roaring of a cascade, the churning of a mill, or as here, the rage and bluster of a storm, if there arise some different sound, even though it be as slight as the whistle of a bird, will strike the ear clear above the general din. And so it was this night, for I caught that stumbling tread even when the gale blew loudest, and sat, motionless and breathless, in my eagerness of listening. And then the gale lulled an instant, and I heard the slow beat of footsteps as of one groping his way down the passage in the dark. I knew it was not Elzevir, for first he could not be back from pool for many hours yet, and second he always whistled in a certain way to show twas he coming, and gave besides a password. Yet if not Elzevir, who could it be? I blew out the light, for I did not want to guide the aim of some unknown marksman shooting at me from the dark. And then I thought of that gaunt strangler that sprang on marble-workers in the gloom. Yet it could not be the man-drive, for surely he would know his own passages better than to stumble in them in the dark. It was more likely to be one of the hue and cry who had smelt us out, and hoped perhaps to be able to reconnoitre without being perceived on so awful a night. Whenever Elzevir went out foraging, he carried with him that silver-butted pistol which had once been Maskew's, but left behind the old rook-piece. We had plenty of powder and slugs now, having obtained a store of both from Ratsey, and Elzevir had bid me keep the matchlock charged, and use it or not, after my own judgment, if any came to the cave, but gave us his counsel that it was better to die fighting than to swing at Dorchester, for that we should most certainly do, if taken. 
we had agreed, moreover, on a poor password which was Prosper the Bonadventure, so that I might challenge betimes any that I heard coming, and if they gave not back this countersign, might know it was not Elzevir. So now I reached out for the piece which lay beside me on the floor, and scrambled to my feet, lifting the deckle in the darkness, and feeling with my fingers in the pan to see it was full of powder. The lull in the storm still lasted, and I heard the footsteps advancing, though with uncertain slowness, and once, after a heavy stumble, I thought I caught a muttered oath, as if someone had struck his foot against a stone. Then I shouted out clear in the darkness a, "'Who goes there?' that rang again through the stone roofs. The footsteps stopped. There was no answer. "'Who goes there?' I repeated. "'Answer, or I fire!' "'Prosper the Bonaventure!' came back out of the darkness, and I knew that I was safe. "'The devil take thee for a hot-blooded young bantam to shoot thy best friend with powder and ball that he was fool enough to give thee!' And by this time I guessed t'was Master Ratsey, and recognised his voice. "'I would have let thee hear soon enough that t'was I, if I'd known I was so near thy lair. But it is more than a man's life is worth to creep down mole-holes in the dark, and on a night like this. And why I could not get out the gibberish about the Bonaventure sooner, it was because I matched my shin to break a stone, and lost the wager and my breath together. And when my wind returned, t'was very like that I was trapped into an oath, which is sad enough for me, who am sexton, and so to say in small orders of the Church of England, as by law established. By the time I put down the gun and coaxed the candle again to light, Ratsey stepped into the cave. He wore a sou'wester and was dripping with wet, but seemed glad to see me and shook me by the hand. He was welcome enough to me also, for he banished the dreadful loneliness, and his coming was a bit out of my old pleasant life that lay so far away, and seemed to bring me once more within reach of some the but dearest. End of chapter 11 Recording by Simon Evers Twelve, Part 1 of Moonfleet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Simon Evers Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner Chapter 12 Part One, A Funeral How he lies in his rights of a man, Death has done all death can. Browning We stood for a moment holding one another's hands. Then Ratsey spoke. John, these two months have changed thee from boy to man. Thou wast a child when I turned that morning as we went up Horehead with the pack-horses, and looked back on thee and Elzevir below, a mask you lying on the ground. "'Twas a sorry business, and has broken up the finest gang that ever rang a cargo, "'besides driving thee and Elzevir to hide in caves and dens of the earth. "'Thou shouldst have come with us that morn, not have stayed behind. "'The work was too rough for boys. The skipper should have piped the reefing hands.' "'It was true enough, or seemed to me true then, for I felt much cast down. "'But only said, "'Nay, Master Ratsey, where Master Block stays, there I must stay too.' and where he goes, I follow. Then I sat down upon the bed in the corner, feeling my leg began to ache, and the storm, which had lulled for a few minutes, came up again all the fiercer, with wilder gusts and showers of spray and rain driving into the cave from seaward. So I was scarce sat down, when in came a roaring blast, filling even our corner with cold, wet air that quenched the weakling candle-flame. "'God save us! What a night!' Ratsy cried. "'God save poor souls at sea,' said I. "'Amen to that,' says he. "'And would that every amen I have said had come as truly from my heart. "'There'll be sea enough on Moonfleet Beach this night "'to lift a schooner to the top of it "'and launch her down into the fields behind. "'I had as lief be in the Mahoon vault as in this fearsome place, "'and liefer too, if half the tales men tell are true, "'of faces that may meet one here. "'For God's sake, let us light a fire.' for I caught sight of a store of driftwood before that sickly candle went out. It was some time before we got a fire alight, and even after the flame had caught well hold, the rush of the wind would every now and again blow the smoke into our eyes, or send a shower of sparks dancing through the cave. But by degrees the logs began to glow clear white, and such a cheerful warmth came out as was in itself a solace and remedy for man's afflictions. "'Ah!' said Ratsey. 
eyes shrammed with wet and cold, and half dead with this baffling wind. "'Tis a blessed thing of fire." And he unbuttoned his pilot coat. "'A needful now, if ever. My soul is very low, lad, for this place has strange memories for me. And I recollect forty years ago, when I was a boy just like thee, old land of Jordan's gang, and I among them, were in this very cave on such another night. I was new to the trade then, as thou might be, and could not sleep for noise of wind and sea. And in the small hours of an autumn morning, as I lay here, just where we lie now, I heard such wailing cries above the storm, hey, and such shrieks of women, as made my blood run cold, and have not yet forgot them. And so I woke the gang, who were all deep asleep as seasoned contrabandiers should be. But though we knew that there were fellow-creatures fighting for their lives in the seething flood beneath us, we could not stir hand or foot to save them, for nothing could be seen for rain and spray, and t'was not till next morning that we learned the Florida had foundered just below, with every soul on board. Ay, tis a queer life, and you and Block are in a queer strait now, and that is what I came to tell you. See here. And he took out of his pocket an oblong strip of printed paper. G. R. Whitehall, 15 May, 1758. Whereof it hath been humbly represented to the King that on Friday the night of the 16th of April last, Thomas Maskew, a Justice of the Peace, was most inhumanly murdered at Hawhead, a lone place in the parish of Children and the county of Dorset, by one Elzevir Block and one John Trenchard, both of the parish of Moonfleet in the aforesaid county, His Majesty, for the better discovering and bringing to justice these persons, is pleased to promise his most gracious pardon to any of the persons concerned therein, except the persons who actually committed the said murder. And as a further encouragement, a reward of fifty pounds to any person who shall furnish such information as shall lead to the apprehension of the said Elzevir Block, and a reward of twenty pounds to any person who shall furnish such information as shall lead to the apprehension of the said John Trenchard. Such information to be given to me, or to the Governor of His Majesty's Jail in Dorchester. Holderness. There, that's the bill, he said, and a vastly fine piece it is, yet I wish that t'was play with other actors. Now in Moonfleet there is none that know your hiding place, and not a man nor woman either that would tell if they knew it ten times over. But fifty pounds for Elzevir, and twenty pounds for an empty pumpkin top like thine, is a fair round sum. And there are vagabonds about this countryside scurvy enough to try to earn it. And some of these have set the excise men on my track, with tales of how it is that I know where you lie hid, and bring you meat and drink. So it is that I cannot stir abroad now, no, not even to the church of Sundays, without having some rogue lurking at my heels to watch my movements. And that is why I chose such a night to come hither, knowing these knaves like dry skins, but never thinking that the wind will blow like this. I am come to tell Block that tis not safe for me to be so much in Purbeck, and that I dare no longer bring food or what not, or these man-hounds will scent you out. Your leg is sound again, and tis best to be flitting while you may, and there's the Eperon door and Chauvelet to give you welcome on the other side. I told him, how Elzevir was gone this very night to Poole to settle with the Bonaventure, when she should come to take us off. And at that Ratsy seemed pleased. There were many things I wished to learn of him, and especially how Grace did, but felt a shyness, and durst not ask him. And he said no more for a minute, seeming low-hearted and crouching over the fire. So we sat, huddled in the corner by the glowing logs, the red light flickering on the cave roof, and showing the lines on Ratsy's face, while the steam rose from his drying clothes. The gale blew as fiercely as ever, but the tide had fallen, and there was not so much spray coming into the cave. Then Ratsy spoke again. My heart is very heavy, John, to-night, to think how all the good old times are gone, and how that Master Block can never again go back to Moonfleet. It was as fine a land as crew as ever stood together, not even excepting Captain Jordan's, and now must all be broken up, for this mess of Maskews has made the place too hot to hold us, and it will be many a long day before another cargo's run on Moonfleet Beach. But how to get the liquor out of Mohune's vault I know not, and that reminds me, 
I've something in my pouches for Elzevir and thee. And with that he drew forth from either lapel a great wicker-bound flask. He put one to his lips, tilting it and drinking long and deep, and then passed it to me with a sigh of satisfaction. Ah, that has a right smack. Here, take it, child, and warm thy heart. Tis the true milk of Ararat, and the last I'll taste this side of the channel. Then I drank too, but lightly, for the good liquor was no stranger to me, though it was only so few months ago that I tasted it for the first time in the Why Not, and in a minute it tingled in my fingertips. Soon a grateful sense of warmth and comfort stole over me, and our state seemed not so desperate, nor even the night so wild. Ratsy, too, wore a more cheerful air, and the lines in his face were not so deeply marked, the golden, sparkling influence of the flask had loosed his tongue, and he was talking now of what I most wanted to hear. "'Yes, yes, it is a sad break-up, and what will happen to the old why not? I cannot tell. None have passed the threshold since you left. Only the Dutchy men came and sealed the doors, making it felony to force them. And even these lawyer chaps know not where the right stands. For Maskew never paid a rent, and died before he took possession. And Master Block's term is long expired and now he's in hiding, and an outlaw. But I'm sorry as for Maskew's girl, who grows thin and pale as any lily. For when the soldiers brought the body back, the men stood at their doors and cursed the clay, and some of the fishwives spat at it. An old mother of each, who kept house for him, swore he had never paid her a penny of wages, and that she was afeard to stop under the same roof with such an evil corpse. So out she goes from the manor-house, leaving that poor child alone in it with her dead father. And there were not wanting some to say it was all a judgment, and called to mind how Elzevir had been once left alone with his, his dead son at the Why Not. But in the village there was not a man that doubted that t'was Block had sent Maskew to his account, nor did I doubt it either. Till a tale got abroad that he was killed by a stray shot fired by the posse from the cliff. And when they took the hue and cry papers to the manor house for his lass, as next of kin, to sign the requisition, she would not set her name to it, saying that Block had never lifted his hand against her father when they met at Moonfleet or on the road, and that she never would believe he was the man to let his anger sleep so long, and then attack an enemy in cold blood. And as for thee, she knew thee for a trusty lad, who would not do such things himself, nor yet stand by whilst others did them. Now what Bratsy said was sweeter than any music in my ears, and I felt myself a better man, as any one must of whom a true woman speaks well, and that I must live uprightly to deserve such praise. Then I resolved that, come what might, I would make my way once more to Moonfleet before we fled from England and see Grace, so that I might tell her all that happened about her father's death, saving only that Elzevir had meant himself to put Maskew away for it was no use to tell her this when she had said that he could never think to do such a thing. And besides, for all I knew, he never did mean to shoot, but only to frighten him. Though I thus resolved, I said nothing of it to Master Ratsey, but only nodded, and he went on. Well, seeing as there was no one save this poor girl to look to putting Maskew underground, I must needs take it in hand myself. Roughing together a sound coffin, and digging as fair a grave for him as could be made for any lord, except that lords have always vaults to sleep in. Then I got Mother Nutting's fish-cart to carry the body down, for there was not a man in Moonfleet would lay hands to the coffin to bear it. And off we started down the street, I leading the wall-eyed pony and the coffin following on the trolley. There was no mourner to see him home except his daughter, and she without a bit of black upon her, for she had no time to get her crepes, and yet she needed none having grief writ plain enough upon her face. When we got to the churchyard, a crowd was gathered there, men and women and children, not only from Moonfleet, but from Rigstave and Monkbury. They were not come to mourn, but to make jibes to show how much they hated him, and many of the children had old pots and pans for rough music. Parson Glenny was waiting in the church, and there he waited, for the cart could not pass the gate, and we had no bearers to lift the coffin. Then I looked round to see if there was any that would help to lift, but when I tried to meet a man's eye he looked away, and all I could see was the bitter scowling faces of the women. And all the while the girl stood by the trolley looking on the ground, 
She had a little kerchief over her head that let the hair fall about her shoulders, and her face was very white, with eyes red and swollen through weeping. But when she knew that all that crowd was there to mock her father, and that there was not a man would raise hand to lift him, she laid her head upon the coffin, hiding her face in her hands, and sobbed bitterly. Ratsy stopped for a moment and drank again deep at the flask, and as for me, I still said nothing, feeling a great lump in my throat, and reflecting how hatred and passion have power to turn men to brutes. "'I'm a rough man,' Ratsy resumed, "'but tender like with all, and when I saw her weep, I ran off to the church to tell the parson how it was, and beg him to come out and try if we too could lift the coffin.' So out he came just as he was, with surplice on his back and book in hand. But when the men knew what he was come for, and looked upon that tall, fair girl bowed down over her father's coffin, their hearts were moved. And first Tom Tewkesbury stepped out with a sheepish air, and then Garrett, and then four others. So now we had six fine bearers, and twas only women that could still look hard and scowling, and even they said no word and not a boy beat on his pan. Then Mr. Glennie, seeing he was not wanted for bearer, changed to parson, and strikes up with, I am the resurrection and the life. It is a great text, John, and though I have heard it scores and scores of times, it never sounded sweeter than on that day. It was a fine afternoon, and what with there being no wind, but the sun bright and the sea still and blue, there was a calm on everything that seemed to say, Rest in peace, rest in peace. And was not the spring with us, and the whole land preaching of resurrection, the birds singing, trees and flowers waking from their winter sleep, and cowslips yellow on the very graves? Then surely it is a fond thing to push our enmities beyond the grave, and perhaps even he was not so bad as we held him, but might have tricked himself into thinking he did right to hunt down the contraband. I know not how it was, but something like this came into my mind, and did perhaps to others, for we got him under, without a sign or word, from any that stood there. There was not one sound heard inside the church or out, except Mr. Glenny's reading and my amens, and now and then a sob from the poor child. But when t'was all over, and the coffin safe lowered, up she walked to Tom Tewkesbury, saying, through her tears, I thank you, sir, for your kindness, and holds out her hand. So he took it, looking askew, and afterwards the five other bearers, and then she walked away by herself, and no one moved till she had left the churchyard gate, letting her pass out like a queen. And so she is a queen, I said, not being able to keep from speaking, for very pride to hear how she had borne herself, and because she had always shown kindness to me. So she is, and fairer than any queen to boot. End of chapter 12, part 1 Recording by Simon Evers Twelve, part of Boonfleet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Simon Evers Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner Chapter 12, Part 2 Ratsy gave me a questioning look, and I could see a little smile upon his face in the firelight. "'Aye, she's fair enough,' said he, as they reflected to himself, "'but white and thin. Maybe she would make a match for thee, if ye were man and woman, and not boy and girl, if she were not rich, and thou not poor and an outlaw, and if she would have thee. It vexed me to hear his banter, and to think how I had let my secret out. So I did not answer, and we sat by the embers for a while without speaking, while the wind still blew through the cave like a funnel. Ratsy spoke first. John, pass me the flask. I can hear voices mounting the cliffs of those poor souls of the Florida. With that, he took another heavy pull, and flung a log on the fire, till sparks flew about as in a smithy, 
and the flame that had slumbered woke again and leapt out white, blue, and green from the salt wood. Now, as the light danced and flickered, I saw a piece of parchment lying at Ratsy's feet, and this was none other than the writing out of Blackbeard's locket, which I had been reading when I first heard footsteps in the passage, and had dropped in my alarm of hostile visitors. Ratsy saw it too, and stretched out his hand to pick it up. I would have concealed it if I could, because I had never told him how I had rifled Blackbeard's coffin, and did not want to be questioned as to how I had come by the writing. But to try him stopping to get hold of it would only have spurred his curiosity, and so I said nothing when he took it in his hands. "'What is this, son?' asked he. "'It's only scripture verses,' I answered, "'which I got some time ago. "'Tis said they are a spell against spirits of evil, "'and I was reading them to keep off the loneliness of this place "'when you came in and made me drop them.' "'I was afraid lest he would ask whence I had got them, "'but he did not, "'thinking perhaps that my aunt had given them to me. "'The heat of the flames had curled the parchment a little, "'and he spread it out on his knee, conning it in the firelight.' "'Tis well written,' he said, "'and good verses enough. "'But he who put them together for a spell "'knew little how to keep off evil spirits, "'for this would not keep a flea from a black cat. "'I could do ten times better myself, "'being not without some little understanding of such things.' "'And he nodded seriously. "'And though I never yet met any from the other world, "'they would not take me unprepared if they should come.' "'for I have spent half my life in graveyard or church, "'and twould be as foolish to move about such places "'and have no words to meet an evil visitor withal, "'as to bear money on a lonely road without a pistol. "'So one day, after Parson Glenny had preached from Habakkuk, "'how that the vision is for an appointed time, "'but at the end it shall speak and not lie, "'though it tarry, wait for it, "'because it will surely come, it will not tarry. "'I talked with him on these matters.' and got from him three or four rousing texts such as spectres fear more than a burned child does the fire. I'll learn them all to thee some day. But for the moment, take this Latin which I got by art. Abite a me in ignem etemum qui paratus est diabolo at angelis eius. English it means, Depart from me into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But had at least double that par in Latin. So that get that after me by heart, and use it freely if thou art led to think that there are evil presences near, and in such lonely places as this cave. I humoured him by doing as he desired, and that the rather because I hoped his thoughts would thus be turned away from the writing. But as soon as I had the spell by rote, he turned back to the parchment, saying, He was a but a poor divine who wrote this, for beside choosing ill-fitting verses, he cannot even give right numbers to them. For see here, the days of our age are threescore years and ten, and though men be so strong that they come to fourscore years, it is this their strength then but labour and sorrow, so soon paths it away, and we are gone. And he writes Psalm ninety twenty one. Now I have said that psalm with parson, verse and verse about, for every sleeper we have laid to rest in churchyard mould for thirty years. And no, it had not but twenty verses in it all told. And this same verse is the clerk's verse, and cometh tenth, and yet he calls it twenty-first. I wish I had a common prayer, and I could prove my words. He stopped, and flung me back the parchment scornfully, but I folded it and slipped it into my pocket, brooding all the while over a strange thought that his last words had brought to me. Nor did I tell him that I had by me my aunt's prayer-book, wishing to examine for myself more closely whether he was right, after he should have gone. "'I must be away,' he said at last, though low to leave this good fire and liquor. "'I would fain wait till Elzevir was back, and fain as till his gale was spent. But it may not be. The nights are short, and I must be out of Purbeck before sunrise. So, tell Block what I say, that he and thou must flit.' and pass the flask, for I have fifteen miles to walk against the wind, and must keep off these midnight chills. He drank again, and then rose to his feet, shaking himself like a dog, and walking briskly across the cave twice or thrice to make sure, as I thought, 
that the Ararat milk had not confused his steps. Then he shook my hand warmly, and disappeared in the deep shadow of the passage mouth. The wind was blowing more fitfully than before, and there was some sign of a lull between the gusts. I stood at the opening of the passage and listened till the echo of Ratsy's footsteps died away, and then, returning to the corner, flung more wood on the fire and lit the candle. After that I took out again the parchment and also my aunt's red prayer-book and sat down to study them. First I looked out in the book that text about the days of our life, and found that it was indeed in the ninetieth psalm, but the tenth verse, just as Ratsy had said, and not the twenty-first, as it was writ on the parchment. And then I took the second text, and here again the psalm was given correct, but the verse was two, and not six, as my scribe had it. It was just the same with the other three. The number of the psalm was right, but the verse wrong. So here was a discovery, for all was painfully written smooth and clean without a blot, and yet in every verse an error. But if the second number did not stand for the verse, what else should it mean? I had scarce formed the question to myself before I had the answer, and knew that it must be the number of the word chosen in each text to make a secret meaning. I was in as great a fever and excitement now as when I found the locket in the Mahoon vault, and could scarce count with trembling fingers as far as twenty-one in the first verse for hurry and amaze. It was fourscore that the number fell on in the first text, feet in the second, deep in the third, well in the fourth, north in the fifth. Fourscore feet, deep, well, north. There was the cipher read, and what an easy trick! And yet I had not lighted on it in all this while, nor ever should have, but for Sexton Ratsey in his burial verse. It was a cunning plan of Blackbird, but other folk were quite as cunning as he, and here was all his treasure at our feet. I chuckled over that to myself, rubbing my hands, and read it through again. Fourscore feet, deep well, north. It was all so simple and the word in the fourth verse, well, and not veil or pool, as I had stuck at so often in trying to unriddle it. How was it I had not guessed as much before? And here was something to tell Elzevir when he came back, that the clue was found to the cipher and the secret out. I would not reveal it all at once, but tease him by making him guess, and at last tell him everything, and we would set to work at once to make ourselves rich men. And then I thought once more of grace and how the laugh would be on my side now, for all Master Ratsy's banter about her being rich and me being poor. Fourscore feet deep well north. I read it again, and somehow it was this time a little less dear, and I fell to thinking what it was exactly that I should tell Elzevir, and how we were to get to work to find the treasure. It was hid in a well. That was plain enough, but in what well? And what did north mean? Was it the north well, or to north of the well, or was it fourscore feet north of the deep well? I stared at the verses, as if the ink would change colour and show some other sense, and then a veil seemed drawn across the writing, and the meaning to slip away, and be as far as ever from my grasp. Fourscore feet deep well north and by degrees exulting gladness gave way to bewilderment and disquiet of spirit, and in the gusts of wind I heard Blackbird himself laughing and mocking me for thinking I had found his treasure. Still I read and re-read it, juggling with the words and turning them about to squeeze new meaning from them. Fourscore feet deep in the north well. Fourscore feet deep in the well to the north. Fourscore feet north of the deep well. So the words went round and round in my head till I was tired and giddy, and fell unawares asleep. It was daylight when I awoke, and the wind had fallen, though I could still hear the thunder of the swell against the rock face down below. The fire was yet burning, and by it sat Elzevir, cooking something in the pot. He looked fresh and keen, like a man risen from a long night's sleep, 
rather than one who had spent the hours of darkness in struggling against a gale, and must afterwards remain watching because, forsooth, the sentinel sleeps. He spoke, as soon as he saw that I was awake, laughing and saying, "'How goes the night, watchman? Is this the second time that I have caught thee napping, and did sleep so sound it might have taken a cold pistol's lips against thy forehead to wake thee?' I was too full of my story even to beg his pardon, but began at once to tell him what had happened, and how, by following the hint that rents he dropped, I had made out, as I thought, a secret meaning in these verses. Elzevir heard me patiently, and with more show of interest towards the end, and then took the parchment in his hands, reading it carefully, and checking the errors of numbering by the help of the red prayer-book. "'I believe thou art right,' he said at length. For why should all the figures be false, if there be no hidden trickery in it? If it had been one or two were wrong, I would have said some priest had copied them in error. For priests are thriftless folk, and had as lief set a thing down wrong as right. But with all wrong, there is no room for chance. So if he means it, let us see what tis he means. First he says, tis in a well. But what well? and the depths he gives of fourscore feet is over-deep for any well near Mainfleet. I was for saying it must be the well at the manor-house, but before the words left my mouth, remembered that there was no well at the manor at all, for the house was watered by a runnel brook that broke out from the woods above, and jumping down from stone to stone, ran through the manor-gardens, and emptied itself into the fleet below. And now I come to think of it, Elzevir went on, it is more likely that the well he speaks of was not in these parts at all, for see here, this blackboard was a spendthrift, squandering all he had, and would most surely have squandered the jewel too, could he have laid his hands on it. And yet, tis said he did not. Therefore I think he must have stowed it safe in some place where afterwards he could not get at it. For if it had been near Moonfleet, he would have had it up a hundred times, but thou hast often talked of Blackbeard and his end with Parson Glenny. So speak up, lad, and let us hear all that thou knowest of these tales. Maybe twill help us to come to some judgment. So I told him all that Mr. Glenny had told me, how that Colonel John Mahune, whom men called Blackbeard, was a wastrel from his youth, and squandered all his substance in riotous living. Thus being at his last turn, he changed from royalist to rebel, and was set to guard the king in the castle of Carisbrook. But there he stooped to a bribe, and took from his royal prisoner a splendid diamond of the crown to let him go. Then, with the jewel in his pocket, turned traitor again, and showed a file of soldiers into the room where the king was stuck between the window-bars, escaping. But no one trusted Blackbeard after that, and so he lost his post, and came back in his age, a broken man, to Moonfleet. There he rusted out his life, but when he neared his end was filled with fear, and sent for a clergyman to give him consolation. And twas at the parson's instance that he made a will, and bequeathed the diamond, which was the only thing he had left, to the Mahune almshouses at Moonfleet. These were the very houses that he had robbed and let go to ruin, and they never benefited by his testament, for when it was opened there was the bequest plain enough, but not a word to say where was the jewel. Some said that it was all a mockery, and that Blackbeard never had the jewel. Others, that the jewel was in his hand when he died, but carried off by some that stood by. But most thought, and handed down the tale, that being taken suddenly, he died before he could reveal the safe place of the jewel, and that in his last throes he struggled hard to speak, as if he had some secret to unburden. All this I told Elzevir, and he listened close, as though some of it was new to him. When I was speaking of Blackbeard being at Carisbrook, he made a little quick move, as though to speak, but did not, waiting till I had finished the tale. Then he broke out with, "'John, the diamond is yet at Carisbrook. I wonder I had not thought of Carisbrook before you spoke. And there he can get fourscore feet, and twice and thrice fourscore, if he list, and none to stop him. "'Tis Carisbrook!' I have heard of that well from childhood, and once saw it when a boy. It is dug in the castle keep, and goes down fifty fathoms or more into the bowels of the chalk below. It is so deep, no man can draw the buckets on a winch, but they must have an ass inside a tread-wheel to hoist them up. 
Now why this Colonel John Mahoon, whom we call Blackbeard, should have chosen a well at all to hide his Julian, I cannot say. But given he chose a well, twas odds he would choose Carisbrook. Tis a known place, and I have heard that people come as far as from London to see the castle and this well. He spoke quick, and with more fire than I had known him use before, and I felt he was right. It seemed indeed natural enough that if Blackbeard was to hide the diamond in a well, it would be in the well of that very castle where he had earned it so evilly. When he says, The well north, continued Elzevir, tis clear he means to take a compass and mark north by needle, and at eighty feet in the well side below that point will lie the treasure. I fixed yesterday with the Bonaventure's men that they should lie underneath this ledge to-morrow as a night, if the sea be smooth, and take us off on the spring tide. At midnight is their hour, and I said eight days on, to give thy leg a week wherewith to strengthen. I thought to make for St. Marlo, and leave thee at the Eperon door with old Chauvelet, where thou couldst learn to pat a French until these evil times have blown by. But now, if thou art set to hunt this treasure up, and hast a mind to run thy head into a noose, why, I am not so old, but that I too can play the fool, and we will let St. Marlo be, and make for Carisbrook. I know the castle's not two miles distant from Newport, and at Newport we can lie at the bugle, which is an inn addicted to the contraband. The king's writ runs but lamely in the Channel Isles and White, and if we wear some other kit than this, maybe we shall find Newport as safe as St. Marlo. This was just what I wanted, and so we settled there and then that we would get the Bonaventure to land us in the Isle of Wight instead of at St. Marlo. Since man first walked upon this earth, a tale of buried treasure must have had a master power to stir his blood, and mine was hotly stirred. Even Elzevir, though he did not show it, was moved, I thought, at heart, and we chafed in our cave prison, and those eight days went wearily enough. Yet t'was not time lost, for every day my leg grew stronger, and like a wolf which I once saw in a cage at Dorchester Fair, I spent hours in marching round the cave to kill the time and put more vigour in my steps. Ratsey did not visit us again, but in spite of what he said, met Elzevir more than once, and got money for him from Dorchester, and many other things he needed. It was after meeting Ratsey that Elzevir came back one night, bringing a long whip in one hand, and in the other a bundle which held clothes to mask us in the next scene. There was a carter's smock for him, white and quilted over with needlework such as carters wear on the down farms, and for me a smaller one, and hats and leather leggings all to match. We tried them on, and were for all the world Carter and Carter's boy, and I laughed long to see Elzevir stand there and practice how to crap his whip and cry, Woohoo! as Carter's do to horses. And for all he was so grave, there was a smile on his face too, and he showed me how to twist a wisp of straw out of the bed to bind about my ankles at the bottom of the leggings. He had cut off his beard, and yet lost nothing of his looks, for his jaw and de deep chin showed firm and powerful. And as for me, we made a broth of young walnut leaves and twigs, and tanned my hands and face with it a ruddy brown, so that I looked a different lad. End of chapter 12, part 2 Recording by Simon Evers of Moonfleet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner. Chapter 13. An Interview. No human creature stirred to go or come. No face looked forth from shut or open casement. No chimney smoked. There was no sign of home, from parapet to basement. Hood And so the days went on, until there came to be but two nights more before we were to leave our cave. Now I have said that the delay chafed us, because we were impatient to get at the treasure. But there was something else that vexed me, and made me more unquiet with every day that passed. And this was that I had resolved to see Grace before I left these parts, 
and yet knew not how to tell it to Elzevir. But on this evening, seeing the time was grown so short, I knew that I must speak or drop my purpose, and so spoke. We were sitting like the seabirds on the ledge outside our cave, looking towards St. Alban's head, and watching the last glow of sunset. The evening vapours began to sweep down channel, and Elzevir shrugged his shoulders. The night turned chill, he said, and got up to go back to the cave. So then I thought my time was come, and following him inside, said, Dear Master Elzevir, you have watched over me all this while, and tended me kinder than any father could his son. And tis to you I owe my life, and that my leg is strong again. Yet I am restless this night, and beg that you will give me leave to climb the shaft and walk abroad. It is two months and more that I have been in the cave, and see nothing but stone walls, and I would gladly tread once more upon the down. Say not that I have saved your life, Elzevir broke in. It was I who brought thy life in danger. And but for me thou mightest even now be lying snug abed at Moonfleet, instead of hiding in the chambers of these rocks. So speak not of that. But if thou hast a mind to air thyself, an hour, I see little harm in it. These wayward fancies fall on men as they get better of sickness, and I must go to-night to that ruined house of which I spoke to thee, to fetch a pocket compass Master Ratsy was to put there. So thou canst come with me and smell the night air on the down. He had agreed more readily than I looked for, and so I pushed the matter, saying, Nay, Master, Grant me leave to go yet a little farther afield. You know that I was born in Moonfleet, and have been bred there all my life, and love the trees and stream and very stones of it. And I have set my heart on seeing it once more before we leave these parts for good and all. So give me leave to walk along the down and look on Moonfleet but this once, and in this ploughboy guise I shall be safe enough, and will come back to you to-morrow night. He looked at me a moment without speaking and all the while I felt he saw me through and through, and yet he was not angry. But I turned red and cast my eyes upon the ground, and then he spoke. Lad, I have known men risk their lives for many things, for gold and love and hate, but never one would play with death that he might see a tree or stream or stones. And when men say they love a place or town, thou mayest be sure, "'Tis not the place they love, but some that live there. "'Or that they loved some in the past, "'and so would see the spot again to kindle memory withal. "'Thus when thou speakest of Moonfleet, I may guess "'that thou hast some one there to see, or hope to see. "'It cannot be thine aunt, for there is no love lost between ye. "'And besides, no man ever perilled his life to bid adieu to an aunt. "'So have no secrets from me, John, but tell me straight— and I will judge whether this second treasure that thou seekest is true gold enough to fling thy life into the scale against it. Then I told him all, keeping nothing back, but trying to make him see that there was little danger in my visiting Moonfleet, for none would know me in a carter's dress, and that my knowledge of the place would let me use a hedge or wall or wood for cover. And finally, if I were seen, my leg was now sound, and there were few could meet me in a running match upon the down. So I talked on, not so much in the hope of convincing him as to keep saying something, for I durst not look up, and feared to hear an angry word from him when I should stop. But at last I had spoken all I could, and ceased, because I had no more. Yet he did not break out as I had thought, but there was silence, and after a moment I looked up and saw by his face that his thoughts were wandering. When he spoke, there was no anger in his voice, but only something sad. "'Thou art a foolish lad,' he said. "'Yet I was young once myself, and my ways have been too dark to make me wish to darken others, or try to chill young blood. Now thine own life has got a shadow on't already that I have helped to cast. So take the brightness of it while thou smayst, and get thee gone. But for this girl... I know her for a comely lass, and good-hearted, and have wondered often how she came to have him for her father. I am glad now I have not his blood on my hands, and never would have gone to take it then, for all the evil he had brought on me, but that the lives of every mother's son hung on his life. 
So make thy mind at ease, and get thee gone, and see these streams, and trees, and stones thou talkest of. Yet if thou hast shot upon the ground, or taken off to jail, blame thine own folly, and not me. And I will walk with thee to Purbeck Gates to-night, and then come back, and wait. But if thou art not here again by midnight to-morrow, I shall believe that thou art taken in some snare, and come out to, to seek thee. I took his hand, and thanked him with what words I could that he had let me go, and then got on the smock, putting some bread and meat in my pockets, as I was likely to find little to eat on my journey. It was dark before we left the cave, for there is little dusk with us, and the division between day and night sharper than in more northern parts. Elzevir took me by the hand, and led me through the darkness of the workings, telling me where I should stoop, and when the way was uneven. Then, thus, we came to the bottom of the shaft, and looking up through ferns and brambles, I could see the deep blue of the sky overhead, and a great star gazing down full at us. We climbed the steps with the soapstone slide at one side, and then walked on briskly over the springy turf, through the hillocks of the coveted quarry heaps, and the ruins of the deserted cottages. There was a heavy dew which got through my boots before we had gone half a mile, and though there was no moon, the sky was very clear, and I could see the veil of gossamers spread silvery white over the grass. Neither of us spoke, partly because it was safer not, not to speak, for the voice carries far in a still night on the downs, and partly, I think, because the beauty of the starry heaven had taken hold upon us both, ruling our hearts with thoughts too big for words. We soon reached that ruined cottage of which Elzevir had spoken, and in what had once been an oven, found the compass safe enough as Ratsy had promised. Then on again over the solitary hills, not speaking ourselves, and neither seeing light in window, nor hearing dog stir, until we reached that strange defile which men call the gates of Purbeck. Here is a natural road nicking the highest summit of the hill, with walls as sharp as if the hand of man had cut them, through which have walked for ages all the few travellers in this lonely place, shepherds and sailors, soldiers and excise men. And although, as I suppose, no carts have been through it for centuries, there are ruts in the chalk floor as wide and deep as if the cars of giants used it in past times. So here Elzevir stopped, and drawing from his bosom that silver-butted pistol of which I have spoken, thrust it in my hand. Here, take it, child, he said, but use it not till thou art closely pressed, and then, if thou must shoot, shoot low, it flings. I took it, and gripped his hand, and so we parted, he going back to Purbeck, and I making along the top of the ridge at the back of Hoare Head. It must have been near three when I reached a great grass-grown mound called Culliford Tree, the marks to the resting-place of some old warrior of the past. The top is planted with a clump of trees that cut the skyline, and there I sat a while to rest, but not for long, for looking back towards Purbeck I could see the faint hint of dawn low on the sea-line behind St. Alban's head, and so pressed forward, knowing I had a full ten miles to cover yet. Thus I travelled on, and soon came to the first sign of man, namely a flock of lambs being fed with turnips on a summer fallow. The sun was well up now, and flushed all with a rosy glow, showing the sheep and the roots they eat white against the barren earth. Still I saw no shepherd, not even dog, and about seven o'clock stood safe on Weatherbeach Hill that looks down over Moonfleet. There at my feet lay the manor woods and the old house, and lower down the white road and the straggling cottages, and farther still the Why Not and the glassy fleet, and beyond that the open sea. I cannot say how sad yet sweet the sight was. It seemed like the mirage of the desert of which I had been told, so beautiful, but never to be reached again by me. The air was still, and the blue smoke of the morning wood fires rose straight up, but none from the Why Not or Manor House. The sun was already very hot, and I dropped at once from the hilltop, digging my heels into the brown burnt turf, and keeping as much as might be among the first champs. 
So I was soon in the wood, and made straight for the little dell, and lay down there, burying myself in the wild rhubarb and burdocks, yet so that I could see the doorway of the manor house over the lip of the hill. Then I reflected what I was to do, or how I should get to speak with Grace, and thought I would first wait an hour or two, and see whether she came out, and afterwards, if she did not, would go down boldly and knock at the door. This seemed not very dangerous, for it was likely from what Ratsey had said that there was no one with her in the house, and if there was, it would be but an old woman to whom I could pass as a stranger in my disguise, and ask my way to some house in the village. So I lay still and munched a piece of bread, and heard the clock in the church tower strike eight, and afterwards nine, but saw no one move in the house. The wood was all alive with singing birds, and with the calling of cuckoo and wood pigeon. There were deep patches of green shade, and lighter patches of yellow sunlight, in which the iris leaves gleamed with a sheeny white, and a shimmering blue sea of ground ivy spread all through the wood. It struck ten, and as the heat increased, the birds sang less, and the droning of the bees grew more distinct. And at last I got up, shook myself, smoothed my smock, and making a turn, came out on the road that led to the house. Though my disguise was good, I fear I made but an indifferent bad ploughboy when walking, and found a difficulty in dealing with my hands, not knowing how ploughboys are wont to carry them. So I came round in front of the house and gave a rat-tat on the door, while my pulse beat as loud inside of me as ever did the knocker without. The sound ran round the building, and backwards among the walks, and all was silent as before. I waited a minute, and was for knocking again, thinking there might be no one in the house, and then heard a light footstep coming along the corridor, yet durst not look through the window to see who it was in passing, as I might have done, but kept myself close to the door. The bolts were being drawn, and a girl's voice asked, "'Who's there?' I gave a jump to hear that voice, knowing it well for graces, and had a mind to shout out my name. But then I remembered there might be some in the house with her besides, and that I must remain disguised. Moreover, laughing is so mixed with crying in our world, and trifling things with serious, that even in this pass I believe I was secretly pleased to have to play a trick on her, and test whether she would find me out in this dress or not. So I spoke out in our round Dorset speech, such as they talk it out in the Vale, saying, A poor boy who is out of his way. Then she opened one leaf of the door, and asked me whither I would go, looking at me as one might at a stranger, and not knowing who it was. I answered that I was a farm lad who walked from Purbeck, and sought an inn called the Why Not, kept by one Master Block. When she heard that, she gave a little start, and looked me over again, yet could make nothing of it, but said, "'Good lad, if you will step on to this terrace, I can show you the Why Not inn, but she's shut these two months or more, and Master Block away.' With that she turned towards the terrace, I following, but when we were outside of earshot from the door, I spake in my own voice, quick but low, "'Grace, it is I, John Trenchard, whom come to say good-bye before I leave these parts, and have much to tell that you wish to hear. Are there any beside in the house with you?' Now many girls who have suffered as she had, and were thus surprised, would have screamed, or perhaps swooned, but she did neither, only flushing a little and saying, also quick and low, let us go back to the house, I am alone. So we went back, and after the door was bolted, took both hands, and stood up face to face in the passage, looking into one another's eyes. I was tired with a long walk and sleepless night, and so full of joy to see her again, that my head swam, and all seemed a sweet dream. Then she squeezed my hands, and I knew twas real, and was for kissing her for very love but she guessed what I would be at, perhaps, and cast my hands loose, drawing back a little, as if to see me better, and saying, "'John, you have grown a man in these two months.' So I did not kiss her. But if it was true that I was grown a man, it was truer still that she was grown a woman, and as tall as I. And these recent sufferings had taken from her something of light and frolic girlhood, and left her with a manner more staid and sober. She was dressed in black, with longer skirts, and her hair caught up behind, and perhaps it was the morning frock that made her look pale and thin, as Ratsey said. 
So while I looked at her, she looked at me, who could not choose but smile to see my carter smock. And as for my brown face and hands, thought I had been hiding in some country underneath the sun, until I told her of the walnut juice. Then before we fell to talking she said it was better we should sit in the garden, for that a woman might come in to help her with the house, and anyway it was safer, so that I might get out at the back in case of need. So she led the way down the corridor and through the living part of the house, and we passed several rooms, and one little parlour lined with shelves and musty books. The blinds were pulled, but let enough light in to show a high-backed horsehair chair that stood at the table. In front of it lay an open volume, and a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles, that often seen on Maskew's nose. So I knew it was his study, and that nothing had been moved since last he sat there. Even now I trembled to think in whose house I was, and half expected the old attorney to step in and hail me off to jail, till I remembered how all my trouble had come about, and how I at last had seen him with his face turned up against the morning sun. Thus we came to the garden, where I had never been before. It was a great square, shut in with a brick wall of twelve or fifteen feet, big enough to suit a palace, but then ill-kept and sorely overgrown. I could spend long in speaking of that plot, how the flowers and fruit-trees, pot-herbs, spice and simples ran all wild and intermixed. The pink brick walls caught every ray of sun that fell, and that morning there was a hushed, close heat in it and a warm breath rose from the strawberry beds, for they were then in full bearing. I was glad enough to get out of the sun when Grace led the way into a walk of medlar trees and quinces, where the boughs interlaced and formed an alley to a brick summer-house. This summer-house stands in the angle of the south wall, and by it two fig-trees whose tops you can see from the outside. They are well known for the biggest and the earliest bearing of all that part, and Grace showed me how, if danger threatened, I might climb up their boughs and scale the wall. We sat in the summer-house, and I told her all that had happened at her father's death, only conceding that Elzevir had meant to do the deed himself, because it was no use to tell her that, and besides, for all I knew, he never did mean to shoot, but only to frighten. She wept again when I spoke, but afterwards dried her tears, I must needs look at my leg to see the bullet wound, and if it was all soundly healed. Then I told her of the secret sense that Master Ratsy's words put into the texts written on the parchment. I had showed her the locket before, but we had it out again now, and she read and read again the writing, while I pointed out how the words fell, and told her I was going away to get the diamond, and come back the richest man in all the countryside. Then she said, Ah, John, set not your heart too much upon this diamond. If what they say is true, t'was evilly come by, and will bring evil with it. Even this wicked man durst not spend it for himself, but meant to give it to the poor. So if indeed you ever find it, keep it not for yourself, but set his soul at rest by doing with it what he meant to do, or it will bring a curse upon you. I only smiled at what she said, taking it to be a girlish fancy. I did not tell her why I wanted so much to be rich, namely, to marry her one day. Then, having talked long about my own concerns as selfishly as a man always does, I thought to ask after herself and what she was going to do. She told me that a month past lawyers had come to Moonfleet, and pressed her to leave the place, and they were given in charge to a lady in London, because, said they, her father had died without a will and so she must be made a ward of Chancery. But she had begged them to let her be, for she could never live anywhere else than in Moonfleet, and that the air and commodity of the place suited her well. So they went off, saying that they must take direction of the court to know whether she might stay there or not, and here she yet was. This made me sad, for all I knew of Chancery was that whatever it put hands on fell to ruin as witness the Chancery Mills at Cern, or the Chancery Wharf at Wareham, and certainly it would take little enough to ruin the manor-house, for it was three parts in decay already. Thus we talked, and after that she put on a calico bonnet and picked me a dish of strawberries, staying to pull the finest, although the sun was beating down from mid-heaven, 
and brought me bread and meat from the house. Then she rolled up a shawl to make me a pillow, and bade me lie down on the seat that ran round the summer-house, and get to sleep, for I had told her that I had walked all night, and must be back again at the cave come midnight. She went back to the house, and that was the most sweet and peaceful sleep that ever I knew, for I was very tired, and had this thought to soothe me as I fell asleep, that I had seen Grace, and that she was so kind to me. She was sitting beside me when I awoke, and knitting a piece of work. The heat of the day was somewhat less, and she told me that it was past five o'clock by the sundial, so I knew that I must go. She made me take a packet of victuals and a bottle of milk, and as she put it into my pocket, the bottle struck on the butt of Maskew's pistol, which I had in my bosom. "'What have you there?' she said. But I did not tell her, fearing to call up bitter memories." We stood hand in hand again, as we had done in the morning, and she said, "'John, you will wander on sea, and may perhaps put into Moonfleet. Though you have not been here of late, I have kept a candle burning at the window every night, as in the past, so if you come to beach on any night you will see that light, and know Grace remembers you. And if you see it not, then know that I am dead or gone, for I will think of you every night till you come back again.' I had nothing to say, for my heart was too full with her sweet words and with the sorrow of parting, but only drew her close to me and kissed her, and this time she did not step back, but kissed me again. Then I climbed up the fig tree, thinking it safer so to get out over the wall than to go back to the front of the house, and as I sat on the wall ready to drop the other side, turned to her and said good-bye. "'Good-bye,' cried she, "'and have a care how you touch the treasure. "'It was evilly come by, and will bring a curse with it.' "'Good-bye, good-bye,' I said, "'and dropped onto the soft, leafy bottom of the wood. "'End of chapter 13 "'Recording by Simon Evers of Moonfleet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner. Chapter 14. The Well House. For those thou mayst not look upon are gathering fast round the yawning stone. Scott. It wanted yet half an hour of midnight when I found myself at the shaft of the marble quarry, and before I had well set foot on the steps to descend, heard Elzevir's voice challenging out of the darkness below. I gave back Prosper the Bonaventure, and so came home again to sleep the last time in our cave. The next night was well suited to flight. There was a spring tide with full moon, and a light breeze setting off the land which left the water smooth under the cliff. We saw the Bonaventure cruising in the channel before sundown, and after the darkness fell she lay close in and took us off in her boat. There were several men on board of her that I knew, and they greeted us kindly and made much of us. I was indeed glad to be among them again, and yet felt a pang at leaving our dear Dorset coast and the old cave that had been hospital and home to me for two months. The wind set us up channel, and by daybreak they put us ashore at Cowes, so we walked to Newport, and came there before many were stirring. Such as we saw in the street paid no heed to us, but took us doubtless for some carter and his boy, who had brought corn in from the country for the Southampton packet, and were about early to lead the team home again. "'Tis a little enough place, this Newport, and we soon found the bugle. But Elsevier made so good a carter that the landlord did not know him, though he had his acquaintance before. So they fenced a little with one another. "'Have you bed and victuals for a plain country man and his boy?' says Elsevier. "'Nay, that I have not,' says the landlord, looking him up and down, and not liking to take in strangers who might use their eyes inside, and perhaps get on the trail of the contraband. "'Tis near the summer statute, 
and the place over full already. I cannot move my gentleman, and will bid you try the wheat sheaf, which is a good house, and not so full as this. Aye, tis a busy time, and tis these fairs that make things prosper. And Elzevir marked the last word a little as he said it. The man looked harder at him, and asked, Prosper what? As if he were hard of hearing. Prosper the Bonaventure, was the answer. And then the landlord caught Elzevir by the hand, shaking it hard, and saying, Why, you are Master Block, and I expected you this morn and never knew you. He laughed as he stared at us again, and Elzevir smiled too. Then the landlord led us in. And this is, he said, looking at me, this is a well-licked whelp, replied Elzevir, who got a bullet in the leg two months ago, in that touch under whore head, and is worth more than he looks, for they have put twenty golden guineas on his head. So have a care of such a precious top-knot. As long as we stopped at the bugle, we had the best of lodging and the choicest meat and drink, and all the while the landlord treated Elzevir as though he were a prince. And so he was indeed a prince among the contrabandiers, and held, as I found out long afterwards, for captain of all landers between Start and Solent. At first the landlord would take no money of us, saying that he was in our debt, and had received many a good term from Mr. Block in the past. But Elzevir had got gold from Dorchester before we left the cave, and forced him to take payment. I was glad enough to lie between clean, sweet sheets at night, instead of a heap of sand, and sit once more with knife and fork in hand before a well-filled trencher. It was thought best I should show myself as little as possible, so I was content to pass my time in a room at the back of the house, whilst Elzevir went abroad to make inquiries how he could find entrance to the castle at Carisbrook. Nor did the time hang heavy on my hands, for I found some old books in the bugle, and among them several to my taste, especially a history of Corf Castle, which set forth how there was a secret passage from the ruins to some of the old marble quarries, and perhaps to that very one that sheltered us. Elzevir was out most of the day, so that I saw him only at breakfast and supper. He had been several times to Carisbrook, and told me that the castle was used as a jail for persons taken in the wars, and was now full of French prisoners. He had met several of the turnkeys, or jailers, drinking with them in the inns there, and making out that he was himself a carter, who waited at Newport till a wind-bound ship should bring grindstones from Lyme Regis. Thus, he was able at last to enter the castle, and to see Well House and Well, and spent some days in trying to devise a plan whereby we might get at the well without making the man who had charge of it privy to our full design. But in this did not succeed. There is a slip of garden at the back of the bugle, which runs down to a little stream. He had met several of the turnkeys, or jailers, drinking with them in the inns there, and making out that he was himself a carter, who waited at Newport till a wind-bound ship should bring grindstones from Lyme Regis. Thus he was able at last to enter the castle, and to see Well House and Well, and spent some days in trying to devise a plan whereby we might get at the well without making the man who had charge of it privy to our full design. But in this did not succeed. There is a slip of garden at the back of the bugle, which runs down to a little stream, and one evening, when I was taking the air there after dark, Elzevir returned and said the time was come for us to put Blackbeard's cipher to the proof. "'I've tried every way,' he said, to see if we could work this secretly. But it is not to be done without the privity of the man who keeps the well, and even with his help it is not easy. He is a man I do not trust, but have been forced to t tell him there is treasure hidden in the well, without saying where it lies or how to get it. He promises to let us search the well, taking one-third the value of all we find for his share. For I said not that thou and I were one at heart, but only that there was a boy who had the key, and claimed an equal third with both of us. To-morrow we must be up betimes, and at the castle gate by six o'clock for him to let us in, and thou shalt not be carter any more, but mason's boy, and I a mason, for I have got coats in the house, brushes and trowels and lime-bucket, and we're going to Carisbrook to plaster up a weak patch in this same well-side. Elzevir had thought carefully over this plan, and when we left the bugle next morning we were better masons in our splashed clothes than ever we had been farm servants. I carried a bucket and a brush, 
and Elsevier a plasterous hammer and a coil of stout twine over his arm. It was a wet morning, and had been raining all night. The sky was stagnant, and one coloured without wind, and the heavy drops fell straight down out of a grey veil that covered everything. The air struck cold when we first came out, but trudging over the heavy road soon made us remember that it was July, and we were very hot and soaking wet when we stood at the gateway of Carisbrook Castle. Here are two flanking towers, and a stout gatehouse reached by a stone bridge crossing the moat, and when I saw it I remembered that it was here Colonel Mohune had earned the wages of his unrighteousness, and thought how many times he must have passed these gates. Elsevier knocked as one that had a right, and we were evidently expected, for a wicket in the heavy door was opened at once. The man who let us in was tall and stout, but had a puffy face and too much flesh on him to be very strong, though he was not, I think, more than thirty years of age. He gave Elsevier a smile, and passed the time of day civilly enough, nodding also to me. But I did not like his oily black hair, and a shifty eye that turned away uneasily when one met it. "'Good morning, Master Wellwright,' he said to Elsevier. "'You brought ugly weather with you, and a drowning wet.' Will you take a sup of ale before you go to work? Elsevier thanked him kindly, but would not drink, so the man led on, and we followed him. We crossed a bailey or outer court where the rain had made the gravel very miry, and came on the other side to a door which led by steps into a large hall. This building had once been a banquet room, I think, for there was an inscription over it very plain in lead. He led me into his banquet hall and his banner over me was love. I had time to read this while the turnkey unlocked the door with one of a heavy bunch of keys that he carried at his girdle. But when we entered, what a disappointment! For there were no banquets now, no banners, no love, but the whole place gutted and turned into a barrack for French prisoners. The air was very close, as where men had slept all night, and a thick steam on the windows. Most of the prisoners were still asleep, and lay stretched out on straw palliasses round the walls, but some were sitting up and making models of ships out of fish-bones, or building up crucifixes inside bottles, as sailors loved to do in their spare time. They paid little to heed to us as we passed, though the sleepy guards, who were lounging on their matchlocks, nodded to our conductor, and thus we went right through that evil-smelling whitewashed room. We left it at the other end, went down three steps into the open air again, crossed another small court, and so came to a square building of stone with a high roof, like the large dovecots that you may see in old stackyards. Here our guide took another key, and while the door was being opened, Elsevier whispered to me, "'It is the well-house,' and my pulse beat quick to think we were so near our goal. The building was open to the roof, and the first thing to be seen in it was that tread-wheel of which Elsevier had spoken. It was a great open wheel of wood, ten or twelve feet across, and very like a mill-wheel. Only the space between the rims was boarded flat, but had treads nailed on it to it to give foothold to a donkey. The patient beast was lying loose stabled on some straw in a corner of the room, and as soon as we came in stood up and stretched himself, knowing that the day's work was to begin. "'He was here long before my time,' the turnkey said, "'and knows the place so well that he goes into the wheel and sets to work by himself.' At the side of the wheel was the well-mouth, a dark, round opening with a low parapet round it, rising two feet from the floor. We were so near our goal. Yet were we near it at all? How did we know Mahune had meant to tell the place of hiding for the diamond in those words? They might have meant a dozen things beside— and if it was of the diamond they spoke, then how do we know the well was this one? There are a hundred wells beside. These thoughts came to me, making hope less sure, and perhaps it was the steamy overcast morning and the rain, or a scant breakfast, that beat my spirit down. For I have known men's mood change much with weather and with food. But sure it was that now we stood so near to put it to the touch, I liked our business less and less. As soon as we were entered, the turnkey locked the door from the inside, and when he let the key drop it to its place, and it jangled with the others on his belt, 
It seemed to me he had up had us as his prisoners in a trap. I tried to catch his eye to see if it looked bad or good, but could not, for he kept his shifty face turned always somewhere else. And then it came to my mind that if the treasure was really fraught with evil, this coarse, dark-haired man who could not look one straight was to become a minister of ruin to bring the curse home to us. But if I was weak and timid, Elzevir had no misgivings. He had taken the coil of twine off his arm and was undoing it. "'We will let an end of this down the well,' he said, "'and I have made a knot in it at eighty feet. "'This lad thinks the treasure is in the well wall, eighty feet below us. "'So when the knot is on well lip, we shall know we have the right depth.' "'I tried again to see what look the turnkey wore when he heard where the treasure was, "'but could not, and so fell to examining the well.' A spindle ran from the axle of the wheel across the well, and on the spindle was a drum to take the rope. There was some clutch or fastening which could be fixed or loosed at will to make the drum turn with the tread-wheel or let it run free, and a foot-brake to lower the bucket fast or slow, or stop it altogether. "'I will get into the bucket,' Elzevir said, turning to me, "'and this good man will lower me gently by the brake until I reach the string-end down below. Then I will shout, and so fix you the wheel.' and give me time to search. This was not what I looked for, having thought that it was I should go. And though I liked going down the well little enough, yet somehow now I felt I would rather do that than have Master Elzevir down the hole, and me left locked alone with this villainous fellow up above. So I said, No, Master, that cannot be. Tis my place to go, being smaller and a lighter weight than thou, and thou shalt stop here and help this gentleman to lure me down. Elzevir spoke a few words to try to change my purpose, but soon gave in, knowing it was certainly the better plan, and having only thought to go himself because he doubted if I had the heart to do it. But the turnkey showed much ill-humour at the change, and strove to let the plan stand as it was, and for Elzevir to go down the well. Things that were settled, he said, should remain settled. He was not one for changes. It was a man's task, this, and no child's play. A boy would not have his senses about him, and might overlook the place. I fixed my eyes on Elzevir to let him know what I thought. A master turnkey's words fell lightly on his ears as water on a duck's back. Then this ill-eyed man tried to work upon my fears, saying that the world is deep and the bucket small, I should get giddy and be overbalanced. I do not say that these forebodings were without effect on me, but I had made up my mind that, bad as it might be to go down, it was yes worse to have Master Elzevir prisoned in the well, and I remained above. Thus the turnkey perceived at last that he was speaking to deaf ears, and turned to the business. Yet there was one fear that still held me, for thinking of what I had heard of the quarry shafts in Purbeck, how men had gone down to explore, and there had been taken with a sudden giddiness, and never lived to tell what they had seen. And so I said to Master Elzevir, "'Art sure the well is clean, and that no deadly gases lurk below?' "'Thou mayst be sure I knew the well was sweet before I let thee talk of going down,' he answered. "'For yesterday we lowered a candle to the water, and the flame burned bright and steady. And where the candle lives, there man lives too.' But thou art right. These gases change from to-day to day, and we will try the thing again. So uh, bring the candle, Master Jailer. The jailer brought a candle fixed on a wooden triangle, which he was wont to show strangers who came to see the well, and lowered it on a string. It was not till then that I knew what a task I had before me, for looking over the parapet and taking care not to lose my balance, because the parapet was low and the floor round it green and slippery with water splashings, I watched the candle sink into that cavernous depth, and from a bright flame turn into a little twinkling star, and then to a mere point of light. At last it rested on the water, and there was a shimmer where the wood frame had set ripples moving. We watched it twinkle for a little while, and the jailer raised the candle from the water, and dropped down a stone from some he kept there for that purpose. This stone struck the wall halfway down, and went from side to side, crashing and whirring, till it met the water with a booming plunge. And there rose a groan and a moan from the eddies, 
like those dreadful sounds of the surge that I heard on lonely nights in the sea caverns underneath our hiding place in Purbeck. The jailer looked at me then for the first time, and his eyes had a gargly meaning, as if he said, There, that is how you will sound when you fall from your perch. But it was no use to frighten, for I had made up my mind. They pulled the candle up forthwith and put it in my hand, and I flung the plaster's hammer into the bucket, where it hung above the well, and then got in myself. The turnkey stood at the brake-wheel, and Elzevir leant over the parapet to steady the rope. "'Art sure thou canst do it, lad?' he said, speaking low, and put his hand kindly on my shoulder. "'Our head and heart sure? Thou art my diamond, and I would rather lose all other diamonds in the world than aught should come to thee. So if thou doubtest, let me go, or let not any go at all.' "'Never doubt, master,' I said, touched by tenderness, and wrung his hand. "'My head is sure. I have no broken leg to turn it silly now.' For I guessed he was thinking of Hoare Head, and how I had gone giddy on the zigzag. End of chapter 15 Recording by Simon Evers Of Moonfleet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner Chapter 15 The Well The grave doth gape, and doting death is near. Shakespeare The bucket was large, for all that the turnkey had tried to frighten me into thinking it small, and I could crouch in it low enough to feel safe of not falling out. Moreover, such a venture was not entirely new to me, for I had once been over Gad Cliff in a basket to get two peregrine's eggs. Yet none the less I felt ill at ease and fearful when the bucket began to sink into that dreadful depth, and the air to grow chilly as I went down. They lowered me gently enough, so that I was able to take stock of the way the wall was made, and found that for the most part it was cut through solid chalk. But here and there, where the chalk failed or was broken away, they had lined the walls with brick, patching them now on this side, now on that, and now all round. By degrees the light, which was dim even overground that rainy day, died out in the well, till all was black as night but for my candle, and far overhead I could see the well-mouth, white and round, like a lustreless full moon. I kept an eye all the time on Elzevir's cord that hung down the well-side, and when I saw it was coming to a finish, shouted to them to stop, and they brought the bucket up near level with the end of it, so I knew I was about eighty feet deep. Then I raised myself, standing up in the bucket and holding by the rope, and began to look around, knowing not all the while what I looked for, but thinking to see a hole in the wall, or perhaps the diamond itself shining out of a cranny. But I could perceive nothing and what made it more difficult was that the walls here were lined completely with small, flat bricks, and looked much the same all round. I examined these bricks as closely as I might, and took course by course, looking first at the north side where the plumb-line hung, and afterwards turning round in the bucket till I was afraid of getting giddy, but to little purpose. They could see my candle moving round and round from the well-top, and knew no doubt what I was at. But Master Turnkey grew impatient, and shouted down, "'What are you doing? Have you found nothing? Can you see no treasure?' "'No,' I called back, "'I can see nothing.' And then, "'Are you sure, Master Block, that you have measured the plummet true to eighty feet?' I heard them talking together, but could not make out what they said, for the bim, bomb, and echo in the well, till Elzevir shouted again, "'They say this floor has been raised. You must try lower.' Then the bucket began to move lower, slowly, and I crouched down in it again, not wishing to look too much into the unfathomable dark abyss below. And all the while there rose groanings and moanings from eddies in the bottom of the well, as if the spirits that kept watched over me, Jewel, were yammering together that one should be so near it. And clear above them all I heard Grace's voice, sweet and grave. 
Have a care, have a care how you touch the treasure. It was evilly come by, and will bring a curse with it. But I had set foot on this way now, and must go through with it. So when the bucket stopped some six feet lower down, I fell again to the diligently examining the walls. They were still built of the same shallow bricks, and scanned course by course as before, I could at first see nothing. But as I moved my eyes downward, they were brought up by a mark scratched on a brick, close to the hanging plummet line. Now, however lightly a man may glance through a book, yet if his own name, or even only one nice it, should be printed on the page, his eyes will instantly be stopped by it. So too if his name be mentioned by others in their speech, though it should be whispered never so low, his ears will catch it. Thus it was with this mark, for though it was very slight, so that I think not one in a thousand would ever have noticed it at all, yet it stopped my eyes and brought up my thoughts suddenly, because I knew by instinct that it had something to do with me and what I sought. The sides of this well are not moist, green, or clammy like the sides of some others where damp and noxious exhalations abound, but dry and clean, for it is said that there are below hidden entrances and exits for the water, which keep it always moving. So these bricks were also dry and clean, and this mark as sharp as if it made yesterday though the issue showed that twas put there a very long time ago. Now the mark was not deeply or regularly graven, but roughly scratched, as I have known boys score their names, or alphabet letters, or a date on the alabaster figures that lie in Moonfleet Church. And here, too, was scored a letter of the alphabet, a plain Y, and would have passed for nothing more, perhaps, to any not born in Moonfleet. But to me it was the cross pole or black Y of the Mahoons, under whose shadow we were all brought up. So as soon as I saw that I knew I was near what I sought, and that Colonel John Mahoon had put this sign here a century ago, either by his own hands or by those of a servant. And then I thought of Mr. Glenny's story, that the Colonel's conscience was always unquiet because of a servant whom he had put away, and now I seemed to understand something more of it. My heart throbbed fiercely, as many another's heart has throbbed when he has come near the fulfilment of a great desire, whether lawful or guilty, and I tried to get at the br- But though by holding on to the rope with my left hand I could reach over far enough to touch the brick with my right, t'was as much as I could do, and so I shouted up the well that they must bring me nearer in to the side. They understood what I would be at, and slipped a noose over the well rope, and so drew it into the side and made it fast till I should give the word to loose again. Thus I was brought close to the well wall, and the marked brick near about the level of my face when I stood up in the bucket. There was nothing to show that this brick had been tampered with, nor did it sound hollow when tapped, though when I came to look closely at the joints it seemed as though there was more cement than usual about the edges. But I never doubted that what we sought was to be found behind it and so got to work at once, fixing the wooden frame of the candle and the fastening of the chain, and chipping out the mortar setting with the plasterer's hammer. When they saw above that first I was to be pulled into the side, and afterwards fell to work on the wall of the well, they guessed, no doubt, how matters were, and I had scarce begun chipping when I heard the turnkey's voice again sharp and greedy. "'What are you doing? Have you found nothing?' It chafed me that this grasping fellow should be always shouting to me while Elzevir was content to stay quiet. So I cried back that I had found nothing, and he should know what I was doing in good time. Soon I had the mortar out of the joints, and the brick loose enough to prise it forward by putting the edge of the hammer in the crack. I lifted it clean out and put it in the bucket to see later on in case of need if there was a hollow for anything to be hidden in but never had occasion to look at it again, for there, behind the brick, was a little hole in the wall, and in the hole what I sought. I had my fingers on the wall too quick for words, and brought out a little parchment bag for all the world like those dried fish eggs cast up on the beach that children call shepherd's purses. Now shepherd's purses are crisp and crackle to the touch, and sometimes I have known a pebble get inside one and rattle like a pea in a drum. And this little bag that I pulled out was dry too, and crackling, and had something of the size of a small pebble that rattled it in the inside of it. Only I knew well 
that this was no pebble, and set to work to get it out. But though the little bag was parched and dry, it was not so easily torn, and at last I struck off the corner of it with the sharp edge of my hammer against the bucket. Then I shook it carefully, and out into my hand there dropped a pure crystal as big as a walnut. I had never in my life seen a diamond, either large or small. Yet even if I had not known that Blackbeard had buried a diamond, and if we had not come hither of set purpose to find it, I should not have doubted that what I had in my hand was a diamond, and this of matchless size and brilliance. It was cut into many facets, and though there was little or no light in the well save my candle, there seemed to be in this stone the light of a thousand fires that flashed out, sparkling red and blue and green, as I turned it between my fingers. At first I could think of nothing else, neither how it got there, nor how I had come to find it, but only of it, the diamond. And there was such a prize, Elzevir and I could live happily ever afterwards, and that I should be a rich man, and able to go back to Moonfleet. So I crouched down in the bottom of the bucket, being filled entirely with such thoughts, and turned it over and over again, wondering continually more and more to see the fiery light fly out of it. I was, as it were, dazed by its brilliance, and by the possibilities of wealth that it contained, and had perhaps a desire to keep it to myself as long as might be, so that I thought nothing of the two who were waiting for me at the well-mouth, till I was suddenly called back by the harsh voice of the turnkey, crying as before, "'What are you doing? Have you found nothing?' "'Yes,' I shouted back. "'I have found the treasure. You can pull me up.' The words were scarcely out of my mouth before the bucket began to move, and I went up a great deal faster than I had gone down. Yet in that short journey other thoughts came to my mind, and I heard Grace's voice again, sweet and grave. "'Have a care! Have a care how you touch the treasure! It was evilly come by, and will bring a curse with it!' At the same time I remembered how I had been led to the discovery of this jewel first, by Mr. Glenny's stories, second by my finding the locket, and third by Ratsey, giving me the hint that the writing was a cipher. And so had come to the hiding-place without a swerve or stumble, and it seemed to me that I could not have reached it so straight without a leading hand. But whether good or evil, who should say? As I neared the top I heard the turnkey urging the donkey to trot faster in the wheel, so that the bucket might rise the quicker. But just before my head was levelled with the ground, he set the brake on, and fixed me where I was. I was glad to see the light again, and Elzevir's face looking kindly on me, but vexed to be brought up thus suddenly just when I was expecting to set foot on terra firma. The turnkey had stopped me through his covetous eagerness, so that he might get sooner at the jewel, and now he craned over the low parapet and reached out his hand to me, crying, "'Where's the treasure? Where's the treasure? Give me the treasure!' I held the diamond between finger and thumb of my right hand, and waved it for Elzevir to see. By stretching out my arm I could have placed it in the turnkey's hand, and was just going to do so when I caught his eyes for the second time that day, and something in them made me stop. There was a look in his face that brought back to me the memory of an autumn evening, when I sat in my aunt's parlour reading the book called The Arabian Nights, and how, in the story of The Wonderful Lamp, Aladdin's wicked uncle stands at the top of the stairs when the boy is coming up out of the underground cabin, and will not let him out unless he first gives up the treasure. But Aladdin refused to give up his lamp until he should stand safe on the ground again, because he guessed that if he did, his uncle would shut him up in the cabin and leave him to die there. And the look in the turnkey's eyes made me refuse to hand in the jewel till I was safe out of the well, for a horrible fear seized me that as soon as he had taken it from me, he meant to let me fall down and drown below. So when he reached down his hand and said, Give me the treasure, I answered, Pull me up, then. I cannot show it to you in the bucket. Nay, lad, he said, cousining me, "'tis safer to give it me now, and have both hands free to help you getting out. These stones are wet and greasy, and you may chance to slip, and, having no hand to save you, fall back in the well. But I was not to be cheated, and said again sturdily, no, you must pull me up first. Then he took to scowling, and cried in an angry tone, Give me the treasure, I say, or it will be the worse for you. 
but Elzevir would not let him speak to me that way, and broke in roughly. "'Let the boy up. He's sure-footed and will not slip. "'Tis his treasure, and he shall do with it as he likes. "'I know that thou shalt have a third of it when we have sold it.' "'Then he, "'Tis not his treasure, no, nor yours either, but mine, "'for it is in my well, and I have let you get it. "'Here yeah, I'll give you a half-share in it. "'But as for this boy, what is he to do with it? "'We'll give him a golden guinea, he'll be richly paid for his pains.' "'Tush!' cries Elzevir. "'Let us have no more fooling. "'This boy shall have his share, or I will know the reason why.' "'Ah, you shall know the reason, fair enough,' answers the turnkey. "'Tis because your name is Block, "'and there is a price of fifty upon your head and twenty upon this boy's. "'You thought to outmit me, and you are yourself outwitted. "'In here I have you in a trap, and neither leaves this room "'except with hands tied and bound for the gallows, "'unless I first have the jewels safe in my purse.' "'On that?' I whipped the diamond back quick into the little parchment bag, and thrust both down snug into my breeches' pocket, meaning to have a fight for it anyway before I let it go. And looking up again, I saw the turnkey's hand on the butt of his pistol, and cried, "'Beware! Beware! He draws on you!' But before the words were out of his mouth, the turnkey had his weapon up, and levelled full at Elzevir. "'Surrender!' he cries, "'or I shoot you dead, and the fifty is mine!' And never giving time for answer, fires! Elzevir stood on the other side of the well-mouth, and it seemed the other could not miss him at such a distance, but as I blinked my eyes at the flash, I felt the bullet strike the iron chain to which I was holding, and saw that Elzevir was safe. The turnkey saw it too, and, flinging away his pistol, sprang round the well, and was at Elzevir's throat before he knew whether he was hit or not. I said that the turnkey was a tall, strong man, and twenty years the younger of the two, so doubtless when he made for Elzevir he thought he would easily have him broken down and handcuffed, and then turned to me. But he reckoned without his host, for although Elzevir was the shorter and older man, he was wonderfully strong and seasoned as a salted thong. Then they hugged one another and began a terrible struggle, for Elzevir knew that he was wrestling for life, and I dare say the turnkey guessed that the stakes were much the same for him too. As soon as I saw what they were at, and that the bucket was safe fixed, I laid hold of the world chain, and climbed up it by swinging myself onto the top of the parapet, being eager to help Elzevir, and get the turnkey gagged and bound while we made our escape. But before I was well on the firm ground again, I saw that little help of mine was needed, for the turnkey was flagging, and there was a look of anguish and desperate surprise upon his face, to find that the man he had thought to master so lightly was strong as a giant. They were swaying to and fro, and the jailer's grip was slackening, for his muscles were overwrought and tired. But Elzevir held him firm as a vice, and I saw from his eyes and the bearing of his body that he was gathering himself up to give his enemy a fall. Now I guessed that the fall he would use would be the Compton Toss, for though I had never seen him give it, yet he was well known for a wrestler in his younger days, and the Compton Toss was his most certain fall. I shall not explain the method of it, but those who have seen it used will know that tis a deadly fall, and he who lets himself get thrown that way, even upon grass, is seldom fit to wrestle another bout the same day. Still, tis a difficult fall to use, and perhaps Elzevir would never have been able to give it, had not the other at that moment taken one hand off the waist, and tried to make a clutch with it at the throat. But the only way of avoiding that fall, and indeed most others, is to keep both hands firm between hip and shoulder-blade, and the moment Elzevir felt one hand off his back, he had the jailer off his feet, and gave him Compton's toss. I do not know whether Elzevir had been so taxed by the fierce struggle that he could not put his fullest force into the throw, or whether the other, being a very strong and heavy man, needed more to fling him. But so it was that instead of the turnkey going down straight as he should, with the back of his head on the floor, for that is the real damage of the toss, he must needs stagger backwards a face or two, trying to regain his footing before he went over. It was those few staggering paces that ruined him, for with the last he came upon the stones close to the well-mouth that had been made wet and slippery by continual spilling there of water. Then up flew his heels, and he fell backwards with all his weight. As soon as I saw how near the well-mouth he was got, I shouted out and ran to save him. But Elzevir saw it quicker than I, and, springing forward, seized him by the belt just when he turned over. The parapet wall was very low, and caught the turnkey behind the knees as he staggered, tripping him over into the well-mouth. He gave a bitter cry, and there was a wrench on his face when he knew where he was come, and it was then Elzevir caught him by the belt. 
For a moment I thought he was saved, seeing Elzevir setting his body low back, with heels pressed firm against the parapet wall to stand the strain. Then the belt gave way at the fastening, and Elzevir fell sprawling on the floor. But the other went backwards down the well. I got to the parapet just as he fell head first into that black abyss. There was a second of silence, then a dreadful noise, like a coconut being broken on a pavement. For we once had coconuts in plenty at Moonfleet when the Batavia man came on the beach, then a deep, echoing blow, where he rebounded and struck the wall again, and last of all the thud and thundering splash when he reached the water at the bottom. I held my breath for sheer horror, and listened to see if he would cry, though I knew at heart he would never cry again after that first sickening smash. But there was no sound or voice, except the moaning voices of the water eddies that I had heard before. Elzevir slung himself into the bucket. "'You can handle the brake,' he said to me. "'Let me down quick into the well.' I took the brake lever, lowering him as quickly as I durst, till I heard the bucket touch water at the bottom, and then stood by and listened. All was still, and yet I started once, and could not help looking round over my shoulder, for it seemed as if I was not alone in the well-house, and though I could see no one, yet I had a fancy of a tall, black-bearded man with coppery face chasing another round and round the well-mouth. Both vanished from my fancy, just as the pursuer had his hand on the pursued, but Mr. Glenny's story came back again to my mind, how that Colonel Mahune's conscience was always unquiet because of a servant he had put away. And I guess now that the turnkey was not the first man these walls had seen go headlong down the well. Elsevier had been in the well so long that I began to fear something had happened to him when he shouted to me to bring him up. So I fixed the clutch and set the donkey going in the tread-wheel, and the patient drudge started on his round, Recking nothing whether it was a bucket of water he brought up, or a live man, or a dead man, while I looked over the parapet, and waited with a cramping suspense to see whether Elzevir would be alone, or have something with him. But when the bucket came in sight, there was only Elzevir in it. So I knew the turnkey had never come to the top of the water again, and indeed there was but little chance he should after that first knock. Elzevir said nothing to me, till I spoke. "'Let us fling the jewel down the well after him, Master Block. It was evilly come by, and will bring a curse with it.' He hesitated for a moment, while I half hoped, yet half feared, he was going to do as I asked, but then said, "'No, no, thou art not fit to keep so precious a thing. Give it to me. It is thy treasure, and I will never touch a penny of it. But fling it down the well thou shalt not, for this man has lost his life for it.' and we have risked ours for it. Aye, and may lose them for it too, perhaps. So I gave him the jewel. End of chapter 15 Recording by Simon Evers